All right, this is lecture 14, um, gene finding. We're going to explore today Markov models and uh, related hidden Markov models. But before um, we get into that, I wanted to um, talk about one feature of R. Um, it's not particularly related to gene finding in any way, but it has co cropped up actually subtly in, in the lecture last class, I believe, and it'll crop up here and there when you look online for solutions and packages. As some programmers use this technique um, called object-oriented programming. Um, it's far beyond the, 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 the scope of this course to give a complete exposition of this concept, but the basic idea is pretty straightforward. And it's actually very powerful paradigm that really helps to keep your code in a very organized way. Um, now, in R, it's actually a bit strange because there's multiple ways of doing object-oriented programming. I think that's probably because, and I'm not an expert here, um, the object orientation was sort of added on um, after the fact, so a posteriori, uh, and it wasn't really built into the language at the beginning. And so I Perhaps there were competing um, views on how to implement um, object-oriented programming in the language. Regardless, there's this um, S3, which uh, a lot of people know uh, at some level. Um, what I mean by that is uh, it's usually people's first introduction to object orientation in R. And then S4, which is slightly more difficult than S3. And then, and then you get into these RS uh, levels um, R5, R6, and to be honest, I don't know R6. Uh, I haven't really, um, I would like to get to know it, but I haven't uh, had the opportunity to date. We're going to look at S4 today. Uh, I think it's a nice compromise um, between um, the unstructured approaches of S3 and the more um, formal approaches of the um, R5. Okay, so... Um, The basic concept uh, are as follows. OO programming begins with the concept of a class, which is something that you already basically, you know, you have a handle on already that there's a class of numeric or character or lo uh, logical, etc. lists, data frames, tibbles. Um, you can actually make new classes on demand. And it's a little bit more complicated, uh, the difference between type and class and R, but this is good enough for our purposes. So we can make classes on demand. And, and then we can make um, objects um, or variables, uh, really, of those classes. So for example, we could think of a genome as a class, right? So just kind of close your eyes and visualize this. Um, and so the, the idea of object-oriented programming is that you, you, you treat this genome as an object that sits there in space, right? You know, you kind of envision of a genome. And there would be a whole bunch of um, objects, one for each genome that you know. For example, there would be this genome object, object for yeast, one for human, one for rat, etc. Right. So the objects are instantiations of the class, right? So it's like you can say, well, we have numerics and 1.3 is one instantiation of a numeric and 7.4 is an instant is one example of a numeric. Just like the yeast genome is one example of the genome class. Now in R, we can use this function set class, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Uh, it's from the R base language. So there's no fancy packages here for tidyverse. And the set class has both required arguments and optional arguments when you're setting up a class. And um, we'll get to that in one second. But the, the real power or one of the real powers of object orientation is that these, this genome object can have many properties or attributes. In R, they're stored in what are called slots. So now when you visualize that yeast genome, you can imagine there's a name associated with that yeast genome. There's annotations, you know, like we looked at last class. There are um, NCBI identifiers. All sorts of information uh, about that yeast genome belong in that class. Uh, in fact, of course, th that also includes the DNA of the chromosome, uh, chromosomes itself. So what object orientation allows us to do is package all those things together 
that are all related to the yeast genome. So think of it uh, before we go on to the concrete example, um, uh, a more um, you know a pedestrian example would be to think of a house as a class. And so I own a house, so I have one instantiation of that class house. And then every house has properties like how many floors? That would be one slot. So my house has three floors. Uh, brick versus vinyl, right? Yeah, um, how many bathrooms? The 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 size of the space. Um, uh, the owner of the um, of the house. All of these things are attributes, and they belong all together in that um, in that object called a house. And in general, object orientation can also have superclasses. So you might think of a house as being a, a subclass of a building. So buildings are can be houses, but they could also be skyscrapers, right? Uh, so you could have different classes that are all contained under a, met, a super class called building for the different kinds of um, buildings we have, houses, greenhouses, sheds, etc. And within the, the, the object or the class, sorry, within the class house, we could also have subclasses. For example, um, uh, you, you might describe, um, uh, let's say, a bathroom by its attributes in terms of, let's say, you know, floor heating or uh, a sink or you know, a shower versus a bath, etc. And so because um, bathrooms could be maybe in different kinds of buildings, it would, be, it would make sense to collect those objects, um, those attributes of a house into one subclass that might be used in other types of buildings, right? Okay, so that's a little bit abstract, but there is another, there is another property of object orientation um, that has to do with that, defining methods on the objects, and we won't talk about that today. Okay, so here's an example uh, that comes really organically out of the course. And uh, last class, you know, it was starting to get a bit confusing having all of these different annotations about uh, yeast, right? So we can create a, um, uh, an object called um, genome that's going to package all those together. So this is just an arbitrary name here. I've, I've called my class genome. This is the set class function that I promised to show. Okay. Now, the first is the actual name of the class. So this would be like saying numeric or um, character or logical. In this case here, our name is going to be genome. And, and usually these match, right? These match together. Okay. Um, it's a little bit confusing why you need to repeat that, but just do it. So uh, there is a convention often in object orientation that new ob new classes have a capital letter. It's not necessary, but it's it's, uh, it's classic. Now here are the slots for our genome that store attributes about our genome, and they're they're, they're pretty intuitive. Organism name, in our case, will be something like Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The chromosomes themselves, and we could reuse the DNA string set that we saw from the biostring packages last class. The annotations in chromosomes names and Go annotations, well, um, uh, we can make those data frames or, or tibbles if we wanted to, but here we make them data frames. Okay, so that's our slots. And, and of course, we could add more slots, more attributes to our class genome, but that's good enough for now. And oops, I need to go. Scrolling down, I need to get off of that pencil. Um, and then there's something, there's two other uh, parts of a class. Uh, one of them is the prototype. Uh, I think it's necessary. It basically says how to instantiate a new object of class genome. So what is its default value? Um, so the, uh, if we don't specify an organism name, chromosomes, these other parameters, we're basically saying here what it should be given by default. So our organism name will be the empty string, the chromosomes will be an empty DNA string set, and the rest of the annotations will just be empty data frames. It's just basically saying, okay, you know, if you don't give me any information, this is what I'm going to pass you back. And um, there's one final thing here, the validity check, which we won't go into here. Um, basically, the validity function here is just empty for us. Uh, basically, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. It, you can use the validity to check that the, the parameters that you pass to the function, to the class, when you're instantiating an object, 
it, this this validity function can check that the law everything is everything is correct everything makes sense that you're not passing a, a number for chromosomes that you're passing actually a set of DNA strings or something that can be coerced into a set of DNA strings that the organism name is not logical etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can check it just basically is a quality control mechanism Okay, so now that we have our set class, we can really go to, that's it. Now we can go to town. So here I, I'm going to call one, uh, I'm going to create an object, a genome object called bland because I don't pass it any parameters here. And so what we see if we print out bland is basically that the organism name is empty. The DNA string set is empty and the data frames are all zero row, zero columns, right? And um, okay, so we created that. That is bland is now it, an object of class genome. Now it's boring, but it's it's bland. But um, I can access now, and this is what comes up, and why I need to show a little bit about uh, object orientation in R, is that you'll see sometimes the use of the at operator instead of the dollar sign, and this is a bit confusing to um, both new and experienced R users. Um, so. Normally, we would say bland dollar sign organism name to recuperate a name of, um, uh, of uh, um, the object bland. But here, with the at operator allows us to sort of reach into that um, object called bland and pull out the organism name. So this is allowing us to access the slots of the um, object. So if I ask for bland at organism name, it just returns um, uh, the empty string. Same thing for if I ask for the chromosomes, it just gives me back um, an empty DNA string set object. Okay, so uh, you, you know if we go back to our house example here, it would be if we had a class house with all sorts of attributes that we I mentioned I listed before, you would say something like you know instantiate. Uh, sorry, let me scroll back up. You know my house is set equal to the host. You know object and then you know it might be like host at address is the address of my house and host um, uh, uh, my host at um, uh, you know floor space might return a numeric which is the square meters or something like that right okay so um, why is this important well I think here's a beautiful example uh, a second example of you of creating a genome um, object of class genome um, and it, you know it, it basically remember last class that we started to collect all this information about the yeast genome and we can load them up individually but aren't they kind of floating around in your environment they you, you know we have to remember that anno is the annotations sc is the actual chromosome sequence you know um, you know it's really uh, kind of a challenge to keep all of that information in your head, right? And if we had multiple genomes, it would be really impossible, right? SC is short for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You just lose data. But now what we can do is in our genome object, we can create a genome called S. cerevisiae uh, from the class genome. And we, we set the organism name appropriately. We pass the sequences to chromosomes, right? That's a DNA string set. We pass the names from SC meta, the annotations from anno, and go uh, to go. Okay. Okay, so now if I ask for the slot organism name, it returns, not surprisingly, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's nice. And I ask for the annotations. I can see it's the tibble uh, that we um, wrangled into our last class. Uh, I can ask for the length of chromosome 3. So here I've asked for the slot that contains the chromosomes, and that's a DNA string set. So if I ask for the third element in that list, the contents of the third element, because it's a double square bracket, I get back the number of base pairs in chromosome 3. And uh, in fact, now, what I, now and, and this is really the powerful thing, yeah, is that if I write this object, S. cerevisia, this object to um, the file, into my, you know, my, my files on the in the project in our studio cloud, it's there for good. So when I load this guy in the future, everything is packaged together, and it's really easy to find by just referring to the slots of the different pieces of information.
Okay, yeah, as I mentioned briefly, there are another aspect of object orientation is the fact that we have functions that operate on our objects. We won't go into that. Um, for, but for example, we might take that function I wrote last class called MyScan that looks for a binding site in a chromosome. And, and you know, MyScan, you know, again, you know, it, it, right now it's in this, it's sitting there in your environment as a function. It's not really um, uh, packaged together with the whole genome object. But, you know, MyScan doesn't just work on a yeast genome, it works on a human genome. So you could put this inside the class of genome. And now MyScan becomes a method, a function, that's specific to genomes. So whenever you create a genome, it has its special function for looking for binding sites. And, and that's really, I, maybe, well, I hope that you start to get some intuition as to why object orientation um, is a powerful programming paradigm. And, and most modern languages have um, some notion of, of object orientation. Now we'll return back to transcription factor binding sites um, and talk about a few remaining concepts that we left open at the end of last lecture. In particular, we didn't really cover too much about how we evaluate um, the performance of our model, and partly that's because it's actually very difficult to uh, evaluate transcription factor binding site um, predictions. So let's talk about that a little bit now. Um, so uh, at one point, we built this log odds ratio of the observed um, uh, motif at a position in the chromosome versus a background model, right? So we had the log of the P of X uh, divided by the background um, across the chromosome. Okay, and uh, this was for four different TFs. I plotted this out and... Uh, yeah, hopefully you can see the axis, the x-axis pretty well, but this is zero, uh, zero, zero, and zero. So zero means in that log odds model that um, it's equally likely that this was generated by random, the background, the denominator, uh, as compared to being generated by, a, a, that actually being a binding motif for the transcription factor, this P at X, right? So it's equal. So anything greater than zero, there's more evidence for it coming as, uh, sorry, there's more evidence that it's a binding site than um, that it was generated by random. So we could, for example, draw our magic line in the sand here at zero. That would make kind of like an intuitive sense that we're saying, okay, anybody to the right of zero will predict as being a binding site. And anything to the left of zero uh, would be, designated as not a binding site. And of course, you can see here already that depending on the transcription factor, this guy here, I don't remember which ones were which, I should have labeled these better, but th there's a number, a small number of um, uh, sites that we would predict to be um, binding sites. And there's very few for this guy, uh, and probably quite a bit more for this guy here and this guy. So the, the number that you would predict as being um, true binding sites is actually dependent on the motif itself, which is kind of a bit um, something to think about, at least, what that means. Um, but, oh, but, you know, we might say, oh, a zero is not strict enough, then we should shift this line over to, say, I don't know, five, right? So there has to be not just a little bit more evidence than ran, that, is, that, the, that the motif, or, sorry, uh, there has to be significantly more evidence that the site corresponds to an actual motif than just background. You, you know, imagine, should you accept, for example, something that's, you know, 0 0.1 as being um, a true site? So sometimes you see that we add an epsilon to shift this to the, to the right to make us, uh, it's, it's more conservative, right? We, we make fewer calls. Okay, so no, but no matter where we set, our, our, our line, we have this issue then of how do we evaluate um, the classifications. And so what we're doing here is a classifier. So what we're saying is for each position in the chromosome, we're labeling it as either a binding site or not a binding site, right? So it, it, now that whether we label it as binding site or not binding site is determined by 
uh, where we set that point along the x-axis, right? So anything to the right is a po we predict as being um, a positive, and anything to the left we would say is uh, is um, not going to be a hit. That's our predictions, right? That's our classifications. It's not reality. Um, in general, we don't know um, which are true or false, right? We're trying to learn that. Now, we need different definitions here that come up over and over again. And, and this is, again, the rudimentary ideas underlying classification and machine learning. So the first idea is that um, of a true positive. So if we predict a position in the chromosome, right? So here's our chromosome, and we're looking at this window here for our motif, right? And if we say, okay, this guy scores five, then because if our line in the sand, right, for this distribution, um, if that's zero there, that means that we might use, uh, if our line was zero, we might say, okay, five is bigger than zero, so we'll predict it to be uh, positive. Now, if it turns out that we can validate that this is tru truly a binding site at that position, we'll call it a true positive, right? So our, correction, our prediction was positive, meaning we, this site was actually a binding site, and it turned out to be actually a binding site in reality. A true negative means that you know, we would be a site that we predict, let's say maybe it scores minus three, and so it's down here, and we say, nope, that's not a binding site. And it turns out that we could validate that, in fact, it's not a binding site. So when I say validate here, I mean that we would go in and say do an experiment like Celex or something, or uh, we'd have to do some actual lab work to show that that, in fact, doesn't bind the transcription factor, right? And that's admittedly very hard to prove a negative, right? I mean, it, you know, think about that, right? In some ways, proving in the lab that something's a true positive might be easier because you would simply try to express the transcription factor and then detect when it binds in that location, et cetera. Um, but if you're trying to prove it's never binding a transcription factor, that's hard, right? Because how do you know you've covered all the conditions of the cell that might bring that transcription factor to that spot, right? And it might not just be that transcription factor, it might be an ensemble of cofactors and RNA molecules, et cetera, that, that, caught, that help it bind or facilitate it binding. And so, you know, try, how would you in the lab really create that biological reality that might actually, you know, um, witness binding of the transcription factor to that place. So it's not really easy to prove something is not a binding site. Often the arguments are more like, you know, this site, the first gene is way, 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 thousands of base pairs downstream, you know, so it's like in the middle of nowhere, you know, this guy here is like nowhere, and it, uh, oh, sorry, this guy here that's positive. Um, oh, no, the negative guy, right? So this is the true negative we're talking about. So. Uh, you know, this guy here is so far away from the next gene that it likely doesn't have, it's not involved in the, um, its transcription. A bit philosophic. And then, okay, so then on the other hand, uh, we have um, concepts like the false positive, which means that uh, we, correct, uh, we, pred we predicted that some site here, um, uh, we predict it to be a positive, so maybe its score was seven. Okay, so you know because its score was seven in that distribution, it exceeds big. It, you know it, it, our line in the sand was zero, so we predict it to be a positive. But it turns out that it's not right. So that again, if you could prove in the lab that it's not a binding site, then this would be called a false positive. So that's not something we want, right? So we 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 um, called something positive that's not. Lastly, a false negative is a position that we predict. So we might say, okay, this guy had a low score, minus 11, way down here. We say, no, nah, it's not a binding site, but it, so we say it's negative, right? So, but it's false negative because we could, we could validate that in fact it is a binding site for the transcription factors. So these two guys are of course not what we want. We wanna maximize our true positive and true negatives, right? And uh, if we were to just have true positives and two negatives with our classifier, then uh, we'd be in, be in business.
So this kind of spells it out uh, a little bit more detail, and um, I suggest that maybe you study this figure a little bit uh, um, on your own too. But I'll go through it quickly here uh, to try and make sure everybody understands. So this distribution here again is the distribution of scores, right? And this might come from our log um, our log odds model, right? P of x divided by the background, right? Okay, sorry, the background, okay. Um, and so uh, we might decide to make our cutoff here, which is zero, okay? So any, mo any scores above zero, we're gonna call uh, a positive, and anything to the left is going to be a negative. Now, I put these x's in here because each x corresponds to a position along the chromosome. Now, I didn't draw arrows for every gray um, uh, node. For every green X, I did draw an arrow. But in, conceptually, every one of these X corresponds to some position along the chromosome, and that's the score. So this guy here that has a score of, say, minus 15 might correspond to this position on the chromosome, and that, posi that position had a score of minus 15 by our model, right? Okay. Now... Uh, in fact, here, the x's um, that are green are true positives. Now, you can see, right, that already that they're kind of scattered. There's maybe enriched up here in this upper tail, which we might expect if our model has any value. But there are some green x's below our cutoff value. In fact, you could see right away that no matter where I put this cutoff value, except maybe way up here, if that's a green guy, um, if I put it way up here, I'd get this guy right, but I'd get all those other green guys wrong. And, and that's the crux, right, of where we're going with this. And if I put this cutoff value all the way down here, uh, well, I would miss all of the true positives, but I wouldn't incur, I, I, would, I would be calling every one of these guys negative. And so, yeah, I'd miss the positives, but I'd get the negatives. Okay, so, but one thing at a time. Each point, like this guy here, maps down to some position there. And it's a true positive, right? Okay, so the point here, the last thing here, is that um, uh, a point like this guy, okay, if we follow it down as here, it's a true positive. And he's to the right, or she's to the right, of this cutoff here. And that means that we predicted it as being positive, so we got it right, right? Okay, we got it right. This guy uh, is also to the right of this line. It's green. It's a true positive. And what? Whoops. I made a mistake. Okay. I made a mistake. So this guy here, uh, I think I got confused because I think that's green. Let me annotate this quickly. It's green. Okay, that point. So it, it, it's, it is actually a true positive. And because it's to the right of this line, when I follow this arrow down, it should be, I put a green there. And because that line, it's to the right of the line, in fact, this is a true positive, right? Okay, I'm sorry I made that mistake. All right. Okay, now this point here is also green. So if I follow it down, it's green. So it's a true positive. These guys, this guy here is just on the, just to the right of the line, it's true positive. And this guy here goes all the way there, so that's a true positive too. So we have some true positives. Um, what do, do we have any false positives? Of course, right? This guy here is gray. This guy here is gray. And if I come down, it's um, not a positive, but he would be predicted by us to be a positive because he's to the right of that line. And so that's a false positive. This guy here is our first false negative. So if I trace this guy back, I see it's coming from a point up here. Now, it's actually green, so it's actually a true binding site, but it's to the left of this line, and so we missed it. So it's a false negative. We predict it as being negative because it's on this side of the line, but falsely so because it's actually a positive, right? So that's bad news. And the last concept we need is a uh, false well, we have false positives, right? False negatives, true positives, and true negatives. Um, there's lots of true negatives, right? All of the gray guys here are all true negatives. So, for example, this point here, 
comes in here, it's, it's a negative, and we predict it as being negative, so that's a true negative. Okay. Now, the last caveat here that I want to mention is, so maybe, I hope that you can read that. This is the background. This pizza thing doesn't work all that great. That's my background distribution, right? Okay. So the last thing I want to point out here is that um, we start off with just partial knowledge of the binding sites. Maybe we have six of them. And there's more than six green X's here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Who knows? Maybe there's a couple hundred binding sites that are uh, for that transcription factor, of which we know six. And those six were used to parameterize our model, right? To build our model, to build the position weight matrix. Uh, however, um, some of these guys, and I, I, de I denoted them here um, in dark green versus light green. So these, these guys with the underscore here, just these T's, this true guys with the underscore, there they correspond to the known binding sites. The dark green guys, uh, this guy, um, this guy, this guy, uh, this guy, and this guy, we didn't know them beforehand. So they're new discoveries, right? Um, we've used some information to predict the rest of the binding sites in the genome. And I, if you look closely, if you blow this up, you'll see that there's dark green and light green. I could have maybe perhaps made it um, a bit more distinctive. I, I, I apologize for that. But the dark greens were not part of the data that was used to parameterize our model. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that is extremely important and a flaw in my approach here, in fact. Because when we evaluate the accuracy of this model, the performance, um, we're going to be actually... We're actually calculating, we're actually including guys that we used uh, to build the model. And, and generally, that's uh, a concept that we want to avoid. If you've read chap the, the chapter, um, the reading for this uh, lecture, you know that they've already started to talk about the importance of separating the learning phase from the testing and validation phases. Okay, And the basic idea is that whatever data you use to learn your model or parameterize your model, and in this case here again, that's our six binding sites, it shouldn't be then used in the evaluation of our model. That turns out to never be fair. Okay, we'll come back to this concept in more detail. Okay, so these are your classic measures of performance, and I have trouble understanding and remembering these all the time. So if you have a challenge with um, um, memorizing these or understanding what they are, you're not alone. I always have to go back and look them up and refresh my memory as to what they mean. But let's focus a little bit on the intuition um, after. Uh, and I'll go back to our previous example. So the sensitivity is the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus false negatives. Okay, so let's go back here and uh, take a look. Now, a true positive means a green guy to the right of our line, and a, um, a false negative is a green guy to the left of our line, right? So, for example, here, if I come in, this is a green guy. He comes down here, and it's, it's uh, a false negative, right? So we should have predicted it positive, but we predicted it never negative falsely. So uh, right now, our, our sensitivity is basically counting the true positive, which is one, two, well, wait, I shouldn't, I should be able to, you know, zoom a bit. One, two, three, uh, four, five, six. I have six true positives. And how many false negatives do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six. So my sensitivity is actually a half. You can validate that on your own time, but I believe my arithmetic is correct. I have six true positives and I have six false negatives, so my sensitivity is uh, six divided by 12. Now, what's the intuition of sensitivity? Um, it's, well, here's the best way to do it, uh, to, I think, to understand sensitivity. If I move this bar all the way to over here, to this line, okay? Let's see if I can, yeah. If I move this bar all the way over to here, very extreme, okay? So I've moved this cutoff down here. 
my true positives are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12. My false negatives are 0. So what is my sensitivity? It's perfect. It's 1. Sensitivity goes from 0 to 1. Okay, so I have perfect sensitivity. I get all of the true binding sites predicted by my model. Now, already you're saying, but that's crazy because all those negatives, yeah, that's not sensitivity. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. If I move this bar all the way over here to, say, some point down there, right? Now, every one of the green guys is a, um, is, is a false negative, and my true positives are zero, so my sensitivity is zero, right? Over here, my sensitivity is one, right? So my sensitivity is awesome if I'm willing to absorb all these false um, positives. Um, and if I move it over here, my sensitivity really sucks because everybody uh, is missed. Okay. So sensitivity alone um, isn't so meaningful, right? Because it seems like something else. But the idea is that, you know, how you think of the sensitive, your algorithm as being sensitive if it if it comes upon in the forest, it's walking through the forest, it comes upon a uh, cute little puppy dog that is actually a true binding site. It's sensitive enough to recognize it as a cute little puppy dog, put it in his arm and take it home, right? An unsensitive uh, classifier, as it walks through the forest, it, it meets a little cute puppy dog and it just leaves it there as a negative, right? I think that really brings it to life. Now, specificity is different. Here, it's the number of true negatives divided by the number of true negatives plus false positives, right? So a true negative is um, the gray guys, right, in our figure. Um, and the false positives are guys to the, the, the gray guys to the right of our line. And sorry, the true negatives are the gray guys to the left of our line, right? So. Now this is just now. Now you can in your head you can just delete the cute little green puppy dogs. You're only looking at the gray guys now. See the sensitivity only looked at the the um, true positives, like the sorry the green guys, and now the specificity only looks at the gray guys. So if my bar is here and my specificity, then my specificity is going to be um, the number of uh, sorry. Let me go back here. The number of true negatives, right? So where are my true negatives? That's all the gray guys down here, and there's an awful lot of them. And where in the second now? So that's the num that's the, the the numerator, right? And there and now I need to know the false positives. The false positives are all of these gray guys over here to the right of my line. So it's going to be the ratio of all of these guys restricted to gray divided by the all of these guys together restricted to gray. Okay, so uh, these are my mistakes, the gray guys in here, right? So again, okay, so here I can't count all these points, but this, let's suppose this is uh, a thousand points, and this is, I say, a hundred gray points, then my, my specificity is going to be 1,000 divided by a thousand plus um, 100, so it's going to be something like uh, 10 11s, right? So it's going to be pretty close to um, perfect just because there's so many um, negatives. Now, my specificity, if I think of my, my specificity now, I come in. I don't understand why my, my, my uh, uh, little pen stops working sometimes, but maybe if I go ahead, come back. Nope. Okay, so it's, it stopped working here. So if I put my specificity, my board, my 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 uh, my cutoff here, what happens to my specificity? So I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any um, true negatives, right? So my my numerator is zero. And everything, all the gray points are false positives, right? Because if my line is down here. All these gray points are predicted correctly. So my specificity is zero. So you have to imagine a zero right here under specificity. Now my specificity on this end, if I move the cutoff over here, what happens is that all these gray points are correctly predicted true, as true negatives. So my numerator is all the gray points. And I have no, um, I have no false positives, right? 
because if my line is here, there's no gray point predicted incorrectly. And so what that means is this is now equal to zero. So my specificity is just basically all the gray points divided by all the gray points, which is one. So, so specificity is sort of contrapositive to the sensitivity. Specificity is zero down here and one up here. Okay. So now, um, so alone, like they're, they're, they're contrapositive to each other, but they're, alone they're not very useful. It's accuracy, which is a combination of sensitivity and specificity. And it's kind of intuitive, right? It's the number of true positives and true negatives your classifier picks out divided by all points. This is just basically all possibilities. So when we go back to here, what that denominator is just the, is all these points. And then what you're saying is, how many true positives do I have? That's these green guys here. And how many true negatives do I have, which are all the gray points there? Now, if my cutoff was, okay, so here's the point. Do I have perfect accuracy? No, because I have mistakes, these green points down here and these gray points up here. So I don't have perfect accuracy. Perfect accuracy. Is there a place I can put my cutoff where I have perfect accuracy? So maybe you want to stop the video and just think about that a little bit, shift this around. The answer is, of course, no. Um, Anywhere I put this line, I'm going to incur some false positives or false negatives. So there is no way uh, in this simple scheme, looking at this distribution of scores from the motifs, to um, perfectly classify binding sites. That's often the case in classifiers. They do not, it's too much to expect that you can ever perfectly predict. What you're hoping to do is predict better than random. We can come back to that later. Okay, now uh, the last thing I wanted to say here is that, and I hinted on this before, is that um, if you're trying to actually validate whether sites are true positives or true negatives, that's pretty difficult and maybe not symmetric. Like I said before, um, it's maybe easier to identify experimentally in the lab whether something is positively a transcription factor binding site because you just need to get the cell conditions correct to show that it actually uh, does work. True negatives are hard to validate because under some cellular condition, maybe there's a set of transcription factors and cofactors that do actually upregulate the gene. In general, in, in, in practice, what people do is they argue that if the transcription factor binding site is too far from a gene or um, you know, up too far upstream, et cetera, then it's probably not a real binding site. That's uh, difficult. That may work in things like yeast, but in human, that may not be as safe to say. The pr transcription factor binding site prediction in general is a really difficult problem to validate. Um, okay, and I want to come back to this issue here, is that uh, we, some of the motifs that were used to train our model, okay, and that was, if I go back to these slides, these guys down here, these, these binding sites that we used to train our model um, were used in the evaluation of its performance, okay, so concretely, I don't want to make you dizzy here, but so these um, any any true that had an underscore is actually part of the the data that was used to parameterize our model to create our position weight matrix. These dark um, green T's were not used. We didn't know that they were true positives. Okay, so uh, when we calculated our accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity, in fact, too, we didn't consider that that some of these were actually part of the training data. We probably should have removed them from our calculation of how accurate the model is. It's not really very safe for, a, you know, you learn a model and um, you might be sort of overtraining, what's called overtraining the model, overtraining. And when you overtrain, basically what it's done is just memorize um, the position of the correct true positives that it's seen already. So, so, okay, let's just keep this intuitive. Um, you know, if you, had, if you built a model like this and it was only capable of, of identifying those motifs that it was learnt on, that's not very interesting, right? You want to know whether that model has predictive capacity to classify new sites in the genome that are either binding sites or not, so either as true positives or true negatives.
Uh, and like I said, the required reading for this week starts to touch on this issue, but we'll come back to it. And I want to even I want to start this really early that you always understand that training your model. So when you build that position weight matrix, that's a separate event from how you validate your model. Okay. Now, one simple approach, and this is a really a thought experiment for you, a reflection point for the class. It's one simple approach to kind of fix this problem right now is that we would only use uh, three of six, for example, of our known binding sites. And then we would evaluate on the other remaining three after we built our model. Um, so why is this not quite correct? And I'll leave that to you as a little puzzle, okay? Uh, so just to make sure that you understand, um, if we go back to here, we would take away, say, randomly choose just three of these six, build our model, run it across the genome, do this analysis, and then we would see if it picked up the four, uh, four five, and six, if we trained on one, two, and three, for example. It's not quite correct. I'll leave it to you to figure out why. Okay, so now um, we're going to switch to uh, um, Markov models and bring these uh, concepts of model and performance and evaluation into, uh, into gene finding, a second problem that's related to binding site prediction, but a little bit more um, robust. I put some points of reflection here. I should have really added to that this uh, uh, example um, from two slides ago about why that scheme of selecting only three of six isn't quite right still. Uh, okay, but I'm not going to come back to these slides now and I'm going to switch over to some um, handwritten notes.